Good morning, everybody. Good morning. This is the second day of uh, the seventh uh, European Summit of Regions and Cities in Bratislava. Welcome to everyone. Hope you had a good day yesterday, an exciting evening, and you enjoyed the entertainment by the riverbank. And we promise that today, though slightly less long, should be just as interesting. And uh, should be just as exciting, and perhaps uh, should as also lead uh, to uh, uh, some answers to a lot of the questions we posed yesterday in terms of uh, uh, how we invest. Uh, we'll be looking into more uh, answering the question in what we invest. So, yesterday we did, we talked about uh, the mechanics of investment, how that should connect with you, the cities and the regions. We heard from many of you about the frustrations that you're facing in actually putting those investments into practice, but we also heard some positive stories about how that's working well. Uh, so, we discussed the politics of, of, of the funds, of the investments. We looked forward a little bit too uh, to the way the budget uh, negotiations can go. We heard from the important actors at every level of decision making. And now we're going to move to a slightly different shift. Yes, indeed. If uh, there was one political message from yesterday's debate on EU funds and cohesion policy, it was uh, the simplification of the whole system. And that's the task for all involved, uh, the European level, the national level, but of course uh, uh, must involve and includes in a fundamental way both regions and cities. And today uh, we are going to move a bit more into the substance, substance of investment. And indeed we did begin some of the debates yesterday in the split sessions, the sessions A and sessions B, and also the showcase is out here uh, in session C. We did, and uh, I think also Vice President uh, Shevchevich helped to bring us into that subject yesterday with his speech, where he was talking about the idea that to be green, uh, to be livable in a region and a city can also be successful economically. And that's the theme we're going to get into a little bit more today, both in the big speeches that we're going to hear and also in the debates we're going to go on to. Yes, indeed. In uh, the session I was sharing yesterday, uh, the session B, we had an interesting debate uh, with uh, the local practitioners who were talking about some of the success stories across Europe in which uh, the challenge is to connect uh, talent, technology, uh, tolerance these days, uh, but also the local territory with some of the global issues. Uh, although it was a very local theme, we spent a lot of time talking about China. Well, I think we should look at a video now. Yes, we do. Uh, to get us into the mood, uh, and then we'll proceed. So, do we have a video ready? Today, many regions and cities in Europe face a significant gap in investment. This represents a threat to future sustainable growth and jobs. There is a strong regional dimension to this challenge. Economy are part of an emerging third industrial revolution. And this revolution has the potential to create jobs and ensure a more balanced and sustainable development of our societies. Regions and cities can be the drivers of this third industrial revolution. They will increase energy efficiency, boost productivity, and pave the way for a sustainable circular economy. They can bring positive and sustainable change, impacting how we do business, govern society, educate our children, engage with our communities, and support their values. Well, we're really very honored to introduce the next speaker to you. Many will know him already as one of the leaders in thinking around the idea of smart cities, smart regions, and digital Europe. Jeremy Rifkind is uh, the president of uh, the Foundation on Economic Trends. You know him, many, many of you as well, as, a, as a, an advisor on some of the projects that you're doing that we're going to hear more about uh, very soon. Uh, and uh, at the moment, the commission is taking forward a lot of these ideas. Um, Jeremy Rifkind, thank you very much for joining us. 
Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. GDP is slowing all over the world, everywhere. And the reason is productivity has been declining for more than a decade all over the world, everywhere. The result, unemployment's very high in every region and it's particularly hard on the millennial generation trying to find a place in this new workforce. Our economists project 20 more years of low productivity, slow growth. And let's do the math. After two industrial revolutions in the 19th, 20th century, arguably we can say that half the human race is far better off today than our ancestors were before the industrial experiment, granted. But I think it's also fair to say that 40% of the human race that's making $2 a day or less is no better off than they were before we began this industrial age. Some are even worse off. And here's the final equation. The 62 richest human beings in the world, we could put them right here in this little part of the room. The 62 richest human beings in the world their combined wealth this morning equals the accumulated wealth of one half the human population living on this planet. Three and a half billion people. There's, there's something very dysfunctional about the way we're organizing our economic life, this human family on this planet today. We are in the long sunset of an industrial era and now this industrial revolution has given rise to a much more profound crisis, an environmental crisis. We have spewed massive amounts of CO2 and methane and nitrous oxide into the atmosphere over the last two centuries, and now we are in real-time climate change. This is no longer a theory. It's no longer looming on the horizon. It's in the house. And what's terrifying about climate change, and if it were explained, we would be justifiably frightened, motivated, driven, and reorganizing our entire position on this planet. Climate change changes the water cycles of the earth. That's what this is all about. It's never explained. We're the watery planet. Our ecosystems have developed over millions of years based on the cloud covers and the water regimes that cycle the earth. Here's the rub. For every one degree that the temperature goes up on this planet because of industrial-induced global warming emissions, for every one degree that temperature goes up, the atmosphere is sucking up 7% more precipitation from the ground. The heat is forcing that precipitation into the clouds. We're getting more concentrated precipitation, more dramatic extreme water events, and they're unpredictable when they come. Blockbuster winter snows, dramatic spring floods, prolonged summer droughts, and wildfires that accompany them, and category three, four, and five hurricanes taking lives destroying infrastructure around the world. This is happening in real time. And I want every parent in this room to hear this. Our scientists now tell us that this runaway water cycle has now unraveling our ecosystems and we are in the sixth extinction event of life on Earth and it doesn't even make the headlines. This is the biggest story since we've been on this planet. We've had five mass extinction events in 450 million years, well before humans were here, and each time there was a sudden turning point in the chemistry of the planet and really quick die out. And each time 10 million years to get new life back on Earth. We're now in the sixth extinction event. This is not a model, we're chronicling it. And our projections show that we could lose over half the species that inhabit this oasis in the universe in less than eight decades. There are babies now who will still be here then. 
This is a wipeout. As my wife says, we're not absorbing the gravity of this moment. 99.5% of all the species that have ever been on Earth have come and gone. We're the youngest anatomically modern humans have been here about 200,000 years, and now we are facing the question of not just civilization surviving, but will our species survive? And even though in many parts of the world people accept climate change, we're going on as business as usual with some greenwashing. That's really what's going on. So now we have an economic crisis that's structural long-term. It's given rise to real-time climate change, which is jeopardizing our ability to survive on this earth. What do we do? We need a new economic vision for the world, and it better be compelling. We need a game plan to deploy that vision, and it better be operable quick in the developing world and the industrial world. We have to be off fossil-based fuels in less than four decades, everywhere, if we have any chance of avoiding the worst of the abyss, because we're now here. So we have to step back and ask this question. How do the great economic paradigm shifts in the world occur? If we know how they occur, we can get a roadmap and a compass here in the European Union and around the world that can navigate us into a new journey quickly. There have been at least seven major economic paradigm shifts in human history, and what's interesting anthropologically is they actually share a common denominator. At a moment of time, three defining technologies emerge and converge to create what we call in engineering a general purpose technology platform, an infrastructure that really fundamentally changes the way we manage power and move economic activity. What are those three defining technologies? Number one, new communication technologies to more efficiently manage the economic activity. Number two, new sources of energy to more efficiently power the economic activity. Number three, new modes of mobility to more efficiently move the economic activity. Obvious. When communication technologies join new energy regimes and new modes of transportation logistic, it changes the way we manage power and move economic life. It changes governance. It changes our temporal spatial relationships. It changes everything. Let me give you two quick examples. First Industrial Revolution, 19th century, communication energy transport revolution. The Brits take us from manual printing to steam power printing. Big leap forward in productivity, cheap print, massive communication. Then the Brits lay out a telegraph system in the last part of the 19th century. Steam power printing and the telegraph then converge with a new energy source in Britain, cheap coal. Then they invent the steam engine to harvest the coal. And what was ingenious, then they put the steam engine on rails, transportation, locomotives, national railways, communication, energy, transport, manage power and move economic life, first industrial revolution. Second industrial revolution in the United States, 20th century, centralized electricity and especially the telephone. I, I know we think the internet's a big deal, but I gotta tell you, the telephone was a big deal. Instant communication at the speed of light, cheap across the world later radio and television. These communication technologies in the United States converge with a new energy source, cheap Texas oil, powered by a new engine called the internal combustion engine, and Henry Ford put everybody on the roads, cars, buses, trucks. Communication energy transport, manage power and move economic life. That second industrial revolution took the whole world through the 20th century, and it peaked July 2008. You remember that month? In that month, Brent crude oil hit a record of $147 a barrel on world markets and the whole global economy shut down. Still, nothing moving. That was the economic earthquake. The collapse of the financial market 60 days later was the aftershock. And the reason is this whole civilization depends on fossil fuels, fertilizers, pesticides, construction materials, pharmaceutical products, synthetic fiber, power, transport, heat and light, it's all made out of and moved by fossil fuels. So when the price of oil goes over about 90 a barrel, all the other prices go up. When you hit around 150 a barrel, prices are high, purchasing power slows. We are in a sunset of wild durations. 
So as we try to move the economy, oil prices go up, we hit these peaks, and then boom, the economy stops. We go down to 30 a barrel, 50 a barrel. We try to regrow the economy again. Prices for oil go up, other prices go up, hits the peak, we go down again. This is a sunset. Oil, natural gas, shale gas, tar sands. So where do we go from here? Let me share an anecdote with you. When Angela Merkel became Chancellor of Germany, she asked me to come to Berlin in the first couple of weeks of her new government to help her address the question of how to grow the German economy on her watch and create jobs. The very first question I asked the new chancellor when I got to Berlin, I said, Madam Chancellor, how do you grow the German economy, create new businesses and jobs, when your businesses are plugged in to a second industrial revolution infrastructure of centralized telecommunications, fossil fuel nuclear power, internal combustion, road, rail, water, and air transport to manage power and move Germany, and that infrastructure peaked in its productivity more than a decade ago in all the industrialized countries. This is crucial, what I've just said. It peaked. We hit a ceiling. That's why productivity is declining. It's the infrastructure that can't give us any more. It's run out of steam. I mentioned the word productivity. There are three features that make up productivity. More capital for better machines and better performing workers, but that's only 14% of productivity. Much of the other 86% of productivity is what we call aggregate efficiency. This is the ratio of potential work to the actual useful work we get out of every single conversion across our value chains. Now stay with me. We take resources out of nature. It could be a rare earth for your phone. It could be a metallic ore for the car. It could be a fossil fuel. All of that is energy, even in material form. And then we move it, we ship it, we store it, we produce things out of it, we consume them, we recycle them back to nature. That's the value chain. At every step of conversion on that value chain, we have to embed some form of energy, whether it's a rare earth or a fossil fuel or whatever, into the product or service to get it to its next stage. But we lose some of that energy in the conversion. This is called aggregate efficiency, the ratio of potential to useful work. Let me give you an example of how it works in nature. It's all based on the, fir the first and second laws of thermodynamics. You can't escape them. In nature, if a lion chases down an antelope and kills it and devours it, only about 10 to 20 percent of the entire energy in that antelope gets embedded into the lion. The rest is heat loss in the conversion. That's its aggregate efficiency. Same in the economy. What does this have to do with my conversation with the Chancellor of Germany? I said to her, the United States started the second industrial productivity. We got up to about 14 percent aggregate efficiency in the mid-1990s. Nothing's changed we peaked in our productivity. Germany got to 18.5% a little later in aggregate efficiency, and Japan led the world in the 1990s at 20% aggregate efficiency, nothing's changed. So I said to the chancellor, and I want every region and every city here to hear this, I said, you can have market reforms and labor reforms and fiscal reforms and monetary forms. You can incentivize a million Steve Jobs and have all sorts of interesting little pilot projects all of which might be interesting, it won't make a damn bit of difference. As long as your businesses are still plugged in to a second industrial revolution platform based on centralized telecommunication, fossil fuel nuclear power, internal combustion, road, rail, water, and air transport. All those reforms are essential, but they accompany a new paradigm shift in infrastructure. They don't precede it. They accompany it. So on that day, I outlined a third industrial revolution, a new convergence of communication, energy, and transport. And at the end of the day, Chancellor Merkel said, Mr. Rifkin, we will have this third industrial revolution in Germany. I'll report back to you what we've done in the last 10 years there. The communication internet is matured. It's been 25 years since the World Wide Web, and everyone here has a smartphone. Now that communication internet is converging with a nascent, digitalized renewable energy internet and a fledgling automated GPS and soon totally driverless road, rail, water, and air internet to create three internets to manage, power, and move economic life. Communication internet, energy internet, transport and logistics internet. These three super internets are a kernel. 
and they ride on top of a platform called the Internet of Things. We are putting sensors in all the devices so they can monitor real-time economic data, send it to other devices, and to us. We have billions of sensors now in the agricultural fields, in factories, smart homes, warehouses, smart vehicles. They're beginning to monitor and send data. But to where? Not the cloud. That's part of it. They're sending it to this emerging communication, energy, and transport internet to manage power and move everyone's value chains. By 2030, we'll have ubiquitous interconnectivity. We are creating a global external brain that's giving us planetary interconnectivity. Potentially a big leap forward for the human race because now, with cheap technology, your smartphone, we can access this planetary brain and we can begin to engage each other directly as a single human family, bypassing a lot of the middlemen and all those big giant integrated companies and enterprises that were the referees. This is the democratization and expansion of social entrepreneurialism across the world. But immediately, while we're excited about the possibility of finally connecting each other, we're chilled by the prospect, the dark net. How do we ensure network neutrality here when everyone's connected? How do we make sure that governments don't purloin this internet planetary connectivity, this internet of things for their own political purposes, already happening? How do we make sure companies don't monopolize this third industrial revolution platform for commercial ends? How do we protect privacy when everyone's connected? How do we guarantee data security? How do we prevent cyber crime and cyber terrorism that could take down the system? These issues are heady. The dark net is as impressive as the bright net. We're going to spend three generations politically on engaging the dark net if we want to get to the promised land here. This is just as important as the bright net. But let's assume this morning we can deal with the dark net. Here's the advantage. Everyone here has a value chain, whether you're a homeowner, a cooperative, a social housing, a small business, a large company, or a government. As this emerges, and it's already starting, this Internet of Things, you can go up there and have a transparent picture of all the economic data flowing through the world. Even big companies didn't have that data. This evens the playing field so everyone can be a player in the economic system. Information that's almost free, you just need to power up and have a provider for your service for your phone, your cell phone. So let's say you're a small and medium-sized enterprise here in Slovakia. You can go up on this emerging Internet of Things now, and it's going to get more robust, and you can cut your big data on your value chain from all the other data going through the system. Just cut it out for almost no cost. Then you can mine your own big data on your value chain, and you can apply your own analytics, create your own algorithms and apps, so you can dramatically increase your aggregate efficiency at every step of conversion on your value chains to manage power and move your economic activity. This means you dramatically increase your productivity, dramatically plunge, plunge your ecological footprint because we're getting more out of each conversion and using less and getting less waste. And the marginal cost of production and distribution in some goods and services with digitalization heads to zero, zero marginal cost. It's my new book is called The Zero Marginal Cost Society. This is already happening. The zero marginal cost society is giving rise to a completely new thing that we didn't know about 10 years ago. It's called the sharing economy, brought on by digitalization. We now have billions of people on the Internet who are not just sellers and buyers. They're not just owners and workers. They are now prosumers and providers and users. At any given time, right now this morning, there are millions of people producing and sharing all sorts of virtual goods with each other, at zero marginal cost, no profit margin, beyond the market, open source with each other as prosumers. Sharing economy. This sharing economy, this little baby that capitalism gave birth to is sitting aside its parent and the parent capitalism has to figure out what the child's going to be so it has to nurture it, create an identity for it, let it have a presence. But it's kind of an uncomfortable relationship because the parent, like many parents, wants the child to be a reflection of the parent but maybe the child has other intentions. We're going to see the emergence of a hybrid economic system. It's already here among the young people. They're sharing the homes, they're sharing the cars, they're sharing energy, they're sharing everything. Part of the day will be in the market. The market's not going to go away. Capitalism is not going to disappear. 
I teach in the oldest business school in the world, the Wharton School, and I guarantee it's not going to disappear. But part of the day, young people are also producing and sharing all sorts of virtual goods with each other at zero marginal cost. So they're going to have two options, which I like, partially in the market, partially in the commons. Capitalism won't disappear, but it will not be the exclusive arbiter of economic life by mid-century. It'll share the stage with its grown-up child. The sharing economy is the first new economic system to enter onto the world stage since capitalism and socialism in the 19th century. It's a, it's a remarkable phenomenon. So let's see how it's is affected the zero marginal cost with the digitalization of communication, and then we'll see how it's going to impact energy, transport, manufacturing, and then we're going to talk about the role of the regions in deploying this infrastructure and the cities. We have, as I said, three billion people who at any given time, they're producing their own music, studio quality, cheap little technology, it's digital. And then you can send it to a billion people for zero marginal cost. That Korean performance artist, remember? put a cheap song and dance together till two years ago, a billion people came to his website in less than 60 days, and it didn't cost anything. We have young people producing and sharing their own YouTube videos, open source, near zero marginal cost. What does it take to take a video on your cell phone and then send it up on the web? We have young people producing and sharing news blogs and social media. They're creating free eBooks. Six million students are taking massive open online college courses taught by the best professors in the best universities, zero marginal cost. Now, there's a big dropout rate in MOOCs. They're going to have to blend that with physical courses, but it's not going to go away. And here is the most improbable venture of all. Jimmy Wales, I don't know how he thought of Wikipedia. I wouldn't have thought this could work. We now have millions of people freely on a nonprofit website, the sixth largest in the world, and the millions of people are constructing the knowledge of the human race for free with each other. This is amazing. We have democratized education in less than 15 years. Apparently, people have nothing else to do after work because I'll put something on my website. Within five minutes, there are thousands of people crawling over that website. What about the footnote? Let's amplify it. We can add something, take it off. It works. Whole industries have been disrupted by the digitalization of communication. Music industries tumble, newspapers and magazines out of business, book publishing suffering, television shrinking. But thousands of new businesses have emerged, not just Facebook and Twitter and Alibaba. We have thousands of startups in this nonprofit profit making, and they're creating the apps. They're creating the platforms. They're creating the connections. They're mining the data. This is a revolution. We thought there'd be a firewall, and while zero marginal cost would impact only the virtual world, it wouldn't crawl over to the physical world. And what I'm saying in zero marginal cost society, the Internet of Things platform just blew us across the firewall. We now have millions of people producing their own solar and wind at zero marginal cost this morning. And with automated GPS, transportation logistics, we're heading toward very low and almost zero marginal cost within the next 15 years. Let's look at Germany. What's happened there? since the first meeting, the chancellor. <laughs> Germany now, 32% of all the electricity in Germany this morning is zero marginal cost solar and wind right now. 35% of that electricity grid will be solar and wind before 2020, and 100% of that energy will be renewables well before 2040. Why? We're seeing an exponential curve, just like in computers. Now, I'm sure I'm the oldest person here, almost. I actually have one friend here in the audience that's a year older than I am. I was a World War II baby. Computers cost millions of dollars in the 40s and 50s, 1950s. And the chairman of IBM said, we'll need five computers for the world, maybe five. They didn't anticipate the Intel chip, Moore's Law, exponential curves. We were able to double the capacity, half the cost on that little chip every two years, and now China has a smartphone for $25 with more computing power than sent our astronauts to the moon. Everyone's going to be connected, even $2 a day. So the fixed costs are plummeting, and within 25 years from now, every little home, office, building will be a micro power plant or the areas around them, and it's going to be so cheap, the solar, the wind, it's going to be in the paint, the glass, the facades, the wind, the geothermal heat pumps. It's going to be as cheap as these technologies because this curve is not going away. But what's interesting in Germany is once you pay for the fixed costs, which are plummeting, and let me say how much they're plummeting, 
We now have power and utility companies that are buying long-term contracts in the U.S. and Europe right now this morning at four cents a kilowatt hour, 20-year contracts. And what this means is they're already moving to parity with the old energies, and they're going to go down, down, down. And the big question facing the power and utility industry, if you care to go into the boardrooms, I meet with them every week, is stranded assets. Stranded assets. So once you pay for the fixed cost, the marginal cost of this energy that's now in Germany, which is a third of the electricity, is zero marginal cost. The wind has not invoiced us. The sun has not sent us a bill. The zero marginal cost energy. So imagine what happens when German businesses, first meeting with the chancellor, plug into this infrastructure, digitalized communication with a digitalized energy internet, and every business is using zero marginal cost energy across every part of its value chain to manage power and move its activity. You tell me how a second industrial revolution region using natural gas or nuclear or fossil fuel competes with that in the next 10 years. It's already happening now. It's a revolution. Who's creating all this new electricity? Well, there are four major power companies in Germany, and we actually we thought they were invincible 10 years ago. I worked with one of them. EMBW, RWE, Vattenfall, and Eon. And what happened to these big four companies is what happened to the music industry and television and newspapers and magazines. It only took 10 years. Little players have come together all over Germany and created electricity cooperatives, farmers, small businesses, neighborhood associations. And every one of them got loans from the banks because they knew they'd pay back by the energy they generated. Nobody turned down. And they're generating all the new electricity. And I should say little Denmark's done this as well. So anyone can do this. The big power companies are only producing 7% of the new energy. They can't scale it because you have to pick up this energy in small amounts everywhere. The sun is everywhere. The wind is everywhere. The geothermal heat's everywhere. You can't vertically scale it like centralized energy. You have to laterally scale it, which favors cooperatives, SMEs, neighborhood associations, regions, and communities. Does that mean that's the end of the power and utility companies? Not necessarily, but they have to change their business model. And so about five years ago, Eon asked if I would debate their chairman, Mr. Tyson, in a neutral country, the Netherlands. We had a three-hour debate, and I said, look, you're not leaving the second industrial revolution tomorrow morning. This is a 30 to 40-year transition. This isn't either or. It's how we get from A to B over four decades. So while you're still in the second industrial revolution, energies and power and transmission, you also have to spin another business with a third industrial revolution model. It's just good business. It's secession over three or four decades. But in the third industrial revolution, smart regions, smart cities, smart Europe, we make money, the power companies, by selling less electricity. Because everyone's going to be producing their own. It's power to the people. This is going to democratize energy like we've democratized uh, knowledge on the Wikipedia. We send the energy back, the electricity back to the grid. So what's the new role of the power and utility companies? They can help manage, erect and manage the energy internet along with ICT, electronics, and other companies. And the way they'll make money is by setting up contractual relations with thousands of enterprises to help manage their energy flows on their value chains. And to the extent that they can help those thousands of enterprises manage their energy flows, use the analytics and big data, create algorithms and apps to allow those thousands of enterprises to increase their aggregate efficiency and productivity, reduce their ecological footprint and marginal cost, those thousands of enterprises will share some of the productivity gains back with the power company. We call it performance contracts. Chairman of Eon five years ago said, nuh-uh, uh-uh. He did it this year. He sold off into a separate company, the fossil fuel and nuclear. They're moving to the energy internet, managing energy services. In Haute de France, where you're going to hear more about this morning, we're involved there. Uh, ERDF has joined us there, RT, they're all there. They're not leaving nuclear, but they now see another business opportunity. This is a transition. It's not just Europe, China. When President Xi and Premier Li came into office, Premier Li, I had never met him, I was kind of shocked actually, he put out his biography and he had said he had read one of my books, The Third Industrial Revolution, up front, and he said, this is where we want to go for China. He instructed the central government Mindful that China lost out on the first Industrial Revolution, got in on the tail end of the second, and didn't want to be lost in the third. 
I've been shuttling back and forth with the Chinese leadership, but to show you how fast China moves, 11 weeks after my first visit, the chairman of the state electricity grid, the largest in the world, announced $82 billion starting this year to digitalize the entire electricity grid in China over the next four years so millions of Chinese people can produce their own solar and wind with their own solar and wind technology and send it back to the grid. Watch Brussels, watch Beijing, hopefully together. The coming, together of the, the coming together of the communication, energy, and transport internet on top of the Internet of Things platform then allows every business in your region to plug in with your 3D printing, your fabrication technology, your new life sciences. And if you plug into the new infrastructure, that's where you get the productivity gains. If you try to plug in these individual little products and services that you think are revolutionary, you plug it into the old infrastructure, of centralized communication, fossil fuel nuclear industry, and, 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 and uh, internal combustion transport, when you manage power and move that activity, you can't get any productivity out of the old platform, regardless of the new products and services you have. This is not rocket science. Now the question becomes, how does this get deployed? Europe is leading, and how does this get deployed? About two years ago, the uh, Prime Minister Renzi took over the rotating consul, as you are in Slovakia. He asked me to join him to issue a declaration for digital Europe, and I did. And then I developed a little memorandum for President Juncker, um, and the Juncker team had already been working independently on all this, so it wasn't as if this just came from me, and they said, well, this is happening. And so the plan for the next stage of Europe, everyone's saying with this crisis in Europe, this crisis going on now, what's the next stage of the journey? Let me be clear here. Europe's always had to have a new journey or it falls back. First the coal and steel community, then the Maastricht community to create a political union, then the euro to create a monetary union, then the extension of 28 states to create a geographic union, then the 2020-20 formula to create a sustainability space, and now digital Europe, smart regions, smart cities, connect across Europe, create an integrated platform to dramatically increase aggregate efficiency and productivity, reduce ecological footprint, reduce marginal cost, and be first class in show around the world for a billion people. 500 million in the, in the partnership regions, and 500 million in the EU. So, where do we get the money? Where's the money? I said we've got the money, the question is how we're spending it. For example, I'll give you an example here in the regions and cities, because it's all about investment. That's what this conference is about. In 2012, the European Union spent 741 billion equivalent U.S. dollars on infrastructure. That's all public-private infrastructure across all the regions and cities, 741 billion dollars. The problem's not the money, it's where it's going. So regions are applying and cities are applying for European funds or national funds, and they're investing it in a second industrial revolution infrastructure of centralized telecommunication, fossil fuel nuclear power, internal combustion transport, and the businesses are plugging into it and there's no more productivity. That platform can't go above what Japan got, 20% aggregate efficiency. We're throwing it away. So I said, if we simply reprioritize the funding, and we do need to fund the second industrial revolution infrastructure over the next 30 years, because it's here, but if we put some of it in the third industrial revolution infrastructure so regions and cities can apply for EU funds or national funds and leverage it against private equity, we'll be there, the infrastructure build out. Be clear, what I'm talking about is the biggest infrastructure paradigm shift since we laid out the interstate highways, the electrification of everything, the introduction of internal combustion transport, this is of the same magnitude in terms of the numbers, the jobs, the businesses. So, we reprioritized. A meeting was held last year in Berlin, hosted by Chancellor Merkel, President Juncker, and President Hoyer of the bank. We brought in the banking community. And they asked me to lay out the same narrative I'm laying out here with the regions. And the reason is, we've reprioritized investment monies, the, the EIB. If you're a region and you want those funds, leverage against private equity and national funds, the priorities are digitalized communication, digital energy, digital transport, digital education for the workforce, and digital healthcare. 
Of course, now we've got to streamline the process because it's outrageous if a region has to spend more money year after year putting those plans in place to get the money, and that costs more than the money they get. We've got to get that moved quickly. But the game plan is starting to come in place. This third industrial revolution will affect every industry. We, it will affect ICT, power and transmission, transport, logistics, construction, real estate, manufacturing, agriculture, life sciences. They all have to be engaged in the build-out and the management of this system in every region of Europe. This means jobs. Who's going to lay out this infrastructure? over 40 years. Robots aren't going to do any of this layout. It requires human labor, skilled, semi-skilled, professional. For example, we have to take the entire fossil fuel and nuclear energy infrastructure and convert it to renewables. But that means every building in Slovakia and every building in Europe has to be converted. Buildings are inefficient. We have to make them efficient by renovating them. But that's not the first, the only thing we do with these buildings. You see, the buildings are the nodes for the Internet of Things platform. They're not just where you work or live. These buildings are the nodes for the platform. Every building has to be renovated to make it efficient. That's a lot of labor to put in the windows, the doors, the insulation. But then they become a big data center. They become a micro power plant to generate energy on or near in the neighborhood. They become a charging station for their electric vehicles and fuel cell vehicles. And all of those nodes, each of those buildings, home office and factory, they are internal to those buildings, full of Internet of Things devices to make the whole building smart. And buildings connect with buildings, connect with buildings like Wi-Fi. The Internet of Things are the buildings as nodes connected laterally across regions, countries, and the entire continents. This is a massive build-out. And one of there's many ways to finance this beside the EU. That's just leveraging. We, we are now working on financing with public bonds, where you can issue a public bond in your region or your country, and that public bonds will be dedicated only to this infrastructure build-out, leveraged with EU funds and other funds. Private equity, equity buys the bonds, the pension funds, the sovereign funds, all the funds. Those funds can only be used for ESCOs, energy service companies, to be able to begin to move this infrastructure, for example, across the buildings. So energy service companies, they get the bonds, they get the money, and then we can scale now real time. Nobody wants to do an ESCO when you're doing one building, but when a region builds out a plan, and the region and all the people in it say, yes, we'd like this whole social housing unit has said yes across this entire square mile. This entire industrial district says we're in. Then you can scale and come in and you can retrofit the building, pay back by the energy savings, then put in the renewables, pay back by the energy savings, then put in the Internet of Things technology, pay back by the energy savings, put in the charging stations, pay back by the energy savings. It's all performance contracting. The owners of the real estate or the renters of social housing, it's a free ride. All they have to do is be inconvenienced, and then the real estate appreciates in value. In France, one study said that real estate, once you do this, appreciates 40%. You just have to have buy-in, which gets me to the regions. In the past, development has been top-down. National plans, top-down, lay it out. Because the infrastructures we laid out were centralized and vertically scaled, you needed top-down management. All right? The rub here is the third industrial revolution infrastructure is a completely different architecture. It's not centralized. It's distributed. It's not... Uh, oh, proprietary and closed, it's open. You can't get any value unless it's open source and transparent. It doesn't vertically scale, it laterally scales, like Wi-Fi. Think the Internet, now the energy Internet, now the transport Internet, now the Internet of Things. Therefore, for the first time in EU history, the subsidiary principle becomes real. What made the EU so interesting politically was the insertion of a new idea in governance, the subsidiary principle, which says that all power must start at the local and regional level and then build out from there. You start at the local and regional level under the subsidiary principle, then you engage the nation state. They're crucial. They have to create codes. They have to create regulations. They have to create standards, and they have to be the facilitators. Then you engage the EU because they have to also be the enablers. So everyone's involved, but the power starts in the region. And what we found 
and you'll hear more about it. We are now in the third year in deployment of Haute de France, the third largest region in France. 340 million already projects, and your own projects, 370 projects. We're now just finishing the Netherlands from Rotterdam to The Hague, and the Vice Mayor of The Hague will be here to talk about that. And we're now doing Luxembourg, the first member state. And what we found out, none of what I'm saying works unless the regions are totally organized with a new way of governance, where the regional government and the cities become the enablers, but they don't just drop the plan in the community. You bring in the business community, the universities, the research institutes, you bring in the schools, you bring in the neighborhood associations, and in Haute de France and now the Netherlands and Luxembourg, there are hundreds and hundreds of people on committees. We work with them, our team works with them, but we don't create the plan. We're there to help them, but they create their own plan, and then they sell it because everyone in the region's involved. No one's left out. It's their plan. This is a subsidiary principle. And when a whole region is motivated and driven, you can't stop it. And we say, come and visit the regions we're in, especially Haute de France, which is in its third year, and just see it for yourself. This means the regions now have a new, a new role to play in Europe and around the world, and the cities, the metropolitan areas in other areas in those regions. You're going to build this out. And you're going to engage your communities and cross-border this so that all of Europe becomes connected and then the partnership regions. This is a big shift. The national governments have a, primary, a, a big role. EU has a big role. The regions and the cities have a big role. So at the European level, uh, you'll hear from Mr. Sefcovic in a few minutes who's been given the task of not just the energy union, but now smart regions, smart cities Europe, and is also now co-chair of global uh, sustainable cities, and with a whole ministerial team that's there as an enabler to help with you. What's the problems? What's the challenges? How do we get the regulations changed? How do we make this move? Everyone's an enabler. Nobody's the ultimate decider on top. It's region to region. It's a revolution. Let me give you just one statistic. I don't have enough time. We are projecting what the economics of this in terms of employment. Uh, I can share this with you a little bit later, but a full deep build out of the Internet of Things platform across the EU. By 2050, the annual uh, employment rate, net employment rate, will be, and the annual employment rate could be, this is an upper scenario, and I may be conservative, up to 8 million new net jobs as we move toward this. That cuts the unemployment rate, which is now 21 million unemployed. It cuts it by 40%, and we will have an unemployment rate, if we do all of this, of around 6%. Not bad. And that's a conservative figure. 6%. We can live with that, because there'll be other opportunities in a sharing economy that take us beyond the market. Last thought. I, this, you know, this business plan, what we've said is when we meet with governments, when we meet with industry, this is a common sense business plan. The technology's there. It needs scale up. What's happening in the regions, you're taking small pilots and they're not integrating into an infrastructure shift so you're not seeing the employment, the new businesses. You can't keep doing small pilots. You have to scale up and the financing has to be there. And I know you're as frustrated as me. You see something new, you say, isn't this great? And then tomorrow morning, you don't see many jobs, do you? You need the infrastructure shift. But it isn't just about technology and infrastructure. Let me close by saying, I'm not a technological uh, determinist and I'm an anti-utopian. I think life's Life is, uh, life is rough. Whether you're a fox in the woods or a human being, it's, it's tough being alive. It's precarious. And I know that there are all sorts of things that can dislodge even good ideas. So even though we have the technology and the infrastructure, and we said to governments, if you have plan B, step forward. Tell me what your plan is. And I hear silence everywhere among governments and business leaders. What is your plan? Staying in the second industrial revolution? Not competitive? and climate change. But there's something else that we need. We really need a change in consciousness because we have to do this within the next three generations. We can't make too many mistakes. Everybody has to be motivated in every region. We have to come together as a human family in region after region after region and collaborate. I'm only guardedly hopeful that this will happen. And if it doesn't, we're lost. And the reason I'm guardedly hopeful is I'm seeing a fundamental shift in the way young people in the millennial generation think, because they're the first generation that grew up totally digital. 
and I'm seeing three basic changes in consciousness in this generation. They're still weak, but a change in the way the young people perceive freedom, power, and identity to community. Let's take freedom. The older generation here, we always believed freedom was the ability to be an autonomous agent, to be self-sufficient, to be independent, to not be beholden to others, and to be exclusive. Freedom is exclusivity, right? The right to be self-contained and independent and not be beholden. For a millennial generation, the idea of being an autonomous agent, an island to oneself, is death. Take away their smartphone, they, they can't even breathe. For them, freedom is the ability to flourish, and that depends on being involved in network after network after network, because as they give their talents to the networks they're in, the networks benefit, and every individual in the network, their social capital goes up. For them, freedom is not exclusivity, it's inclusivity. It's not ownership, it's access. It's the ability to be part of a larger community, and this is a vast extension of social entrepreneurialism. It's a change in the way we see freedom. Power. The older generation, <laughs> we grew up believing power is always a pyramid, correct? From the one to the many, the 1% to the 99%, all through history it's a pyramid, but that's actually not true. For 94% of human history, we are foragers and hunters. There was no pyramid because there was no surplus, no property. People had to live in the commons. But what's interesting about today in terms of freedom is the young people have a different um, a power. The young kids have a different notion of power. For them, power is being nestled in all these networks where they benefit each other and their individual social capital really is improved by the network. So they have a completely different idea of power, not just freedom. And finally, and this is a game changer, we are just beginning to see amongst all the problems going on in the world today. The problem is everything's coming together while everything falls apart. You follow me? Everything's coming together while everything falls apart. Because what's happening now is all the old forms of consciousness are threatened. We have people fighting tribal blood wars and religious wars and ideological wars. Whereas the younger generation is all up on Facebook, a billion kids in the largest fictional family in history. They're Skyping in global classrooms. They're connecting as a human family. What we're beginning to see among the millennials is what I would call biosphere consciousness. Let me explain. I grew up in a geopolitical world post-Westphalia, the nation state. And in that world, we came to believe that each individual has a right to be a sovereign. It's an inalienable right. And by being a sovereign, we then compete with other sovereign individuals for scarce resources in the market. It's a zero-sum game. Our nation states are sovereign. They represent all the individual citizens who are sovereign, and they compete against other nation states for scarce resources in the marketplace and often in the battlefield. Zero-sum game. Can anyone here in this room tell me how we come together as a human family, collaboratively and collectively address climate change, region to region, think global, act local? Can anyone tell me how we do that with the worldview I just explained? Geopolitics. The millennials don't think that way. They're beginning to connect to the biosphere. That 19 kilometers from the stratosphere to the oceans where life and the chemicals of the planet create the biology of the earth. We've got 14-year-old kids coming home, and they're saying to their parents, why is dad using so much water while he shaves? These are the biosphere police. They're saying, why is the TV on? We haven't been in that room for three days. And the biosphere police. Why two cars? How about car sharing one? And what I particularly like is we have young people coming home and they're asking, where did the hamburger come from on the plate? Let me explain. The number one cause of global warming emissions is buildings, but we're going to transform every building into a node that's off the old fuels. The number three cause of global warming is transport, but we're going to shift that. So all the vehicles are electric, they're fuel cell, they're 3D printed with recycled material, we already have a car out, and they're running driverless. But the number two cause of climate change that no one talks about is beef production and consumption. Massive methane and nitrous oxide, number two, no one even wants to talk about it. We won't want to change our dietary habits slightly. This shows we're not there yet. So we got kids coming home and saying to their parents, where'd this, piece of, where'd this beef come from? Did it come from a rainforest? Did they have to destroy the trees for three inches of soil for that, to graze that cow? 
the kids understand when the trees are destroyed, all the rare animal life that only lives in that little tree canopy extinct. No trees, they can't absorb CO2 from industrial emissions. That means some farmer can't feed their child because they're getting runaway floods in the spring, summer droughts, and wildfires in late summer because of the piece of beef on the table. The children are learning ecological footprint. They're learning that everything we do intimately affects some other human, some other creature, the ecosystems of this planet, the biosphere. They're beginning to realize that our well-being individually and collectively depends on the well-being of all the other species and all of the interactions that maintain this indivisible community we live in. This is biosphere consciousness. The mission of the regions is not just to lay out the technology and the infrastructure. That is going to be your mission around the world, the regions and cities. But we also have to work with each other on how we begin to establish a new frame of reference to empathize with the entire life on this planet, not just a selected few. So we can begin to bring the human family together, recognize our fellow creatures as part of this biology of this community we live in, and recognize the Earth as our indivisible community. If we don't do that, we won't get there. So last, last thought. What I've outlined is a tough challenge. I wouldn't bet on it. But on the other hand, as I've seen this emerge, and you'll have a panel later in these three places we're in now, I'm just shocked at the drive and motivation when people are told it's up to you. Seeing thousands and thousands of people committed across business and industry and universities and civil society and actually doing the hard work of laying out platforms, laying out proposals, and then getting the job done year after year. This can be done in every region. And now, since everyone's looking at the European Union to be the flagship for this new era in history, I don't want to scare you. It's all going to come down to the regions. I really mean this. And the cities, the covenant cities and the regions. So together, if you begin to customize to your region this plan, start cross-bordering, bring in all your regions and communities, this is the new Europe. This is the Europe where everyone in a local region or community feels, yes, I'm part of the EU. I understand it now because I'm getting the benefits, I'm part of it, I'm a participant, it's my Europe, I am the infrastructure. Every human being can say, I am the infrastructure in my node, my building, my, my school, my business. When everyone believes, and they are, the node of the infrastructure, you won't see this extreme political revolt, you won't see people alienated because and everyone's working together to take Europe to the next stage of the European dream a journey that can help us replenish the planet, reduce our ecological footprint, give our young people a future that they can depend on, create a more sustainable and humane and democratic economic way of living, make the world a better place. We can do better. Thank you.